of his power and of his control. Jesus' life did not begin with a whimper, but a bang. The most important birth on earth, and the very first Christmas, was almost ruined by the first Christmas Grinch. And he was a mean one. <laughs> he killed members of the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish ruling council. He killed 300 court officers. He killed his wife and his mother-in-law. And he killed three <coughs> of his sons for stepping up place. Mm. Herod the Great was not known for being a great philanthropist or humanitarian. He was known for being a great builder. <coughs> he built Masada. He built the temple. And what still remains today, the Wailing Wall, that was him. He built Herodian. And he built Caesarea Philippi. And numerous other places all around Jerusalem and Israel. In fact, in Caesarea Philippi, he, through sheer force of will, created a port where there was none by sinking huge blocks of stone into the Mediterranean. And this was the first actual man-made port. And you can still see his buildings 2,000 years later. If we look at something comparable today, it would be like someone built the Sea to Sky Highway, the Copahalla, the Harbor Center, and the Portman Bridge all rolled into one. But he built on the backs of his people. Mm -hmm. And they didn't like him. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, he knew he wasn't liked, so on his death, he ordered that all the notable men in Jerusalem be killed if they will not weep for me. I will make them weep. Mm. His retainers wisely did not carry out this order. <laughs> <laughs> but this Grinch wasn't happy with stealing the presents at Christmas. Oh no. He wanted the very life, literally the soul of baby Jesus. Oh. In his paranoia and fear, he ordered the death of all the male babies in the 300-person small village of Bethlehem. And at least 20 to 30 innocent children were killed, as we saw in the clip. In Matthew here, when he talks about it, he uses the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word harag, which means to murder, to slaughter, to destroy, and not the gentler Katal to kill. And so the Grinch was about to steal Christmas. But God acted. Young Joseph, who had stood by his wife Mary, even when it looked like she might have been unfaithful to him, stood by her and now had a young baby. And he was in the city of Bethlehem, taking care of his family, working to support them. And he had a dream. In this dream, an angel of the Lord spoke to him and warned him to flee to Egypt from Herod, the baby-killing Grinch. And in the night, nuptos in the Greek, from which we get the word nocturnal, under the cover of darkness, the young family fled. Now Joseph here, he really shows his chops. He really proves his worth in protecting his family. He, to his credit, instantly obeys the dream and saves Jesus from an early death. As Tom Wright puts it, Jesus was born with a price on his head. People found Jesus a threat, and they still do to this day. But for Jesus, there was no point arriving in comfort when the world is in misery. 
There is no point having an easy life when the world suffers violence and injustice. Herod that Grinch could not stop Christmas. And even today, there are Herods who try to stop God's children, his people. But as long as we are faithful and obey, God will save us. Now as we look at the passage, it says they got up in the, during the night and left for Egypt. But why Egypt? Isn't Egypt the place where they were oppressed for years? <laughs> I mean, what, what's going on there? Well, here's why. Egypt at the time had more than a million Jews in Alexandria. And in every city in Egypt, there was a colony of Jews. Often throughout the troubled centuries before Jesus came, when some peril and some tyranny and some persecution arose, life intolerable being for the Jews, they sought refuge in Egypt. Jeremiah, when Babylon came to destroy Israel, was taken to Egypt by the Jews, fleeing. So they ran to Egypt for safety, even though, you know, a long time ago they'd been oppressed there as slaves. So there was a sort of painful history, love-hate relationship going on there. But they knew each other. <laughs> However, Egypt was not a bed of roses. According to William Barclay, Egypt was proverbially the land of sorcery, of witchcraft, and of magic. Yeah. And so the Talmud, which is written by Jewish people, it's their history there, not including the Old Testament, this is the separate one, maintains Yeshua, which is Jesus, was a magician and learned his skills in Egypt. Oh, yeah. Also, in Celsus, in the second century, a Roman anti Christian writer, he claims that Jesus was in Egypt and got his miraculous powers from Egypt and not from God. But Jesus came as a baby and left as a little child, most likely still a baby. Therefore, he had no chance to apprentice this magic in Egypt. As we look at verse 15, it says, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Now, this is actually from Hosea, but they don't mention that for one reason. This is actually the audible voice of God talking here. This isn't the prophet Hosea himself. This is God speaking. Matthew makes sure the Lord here is speaking with the result that the son belongs to God. The son here is Israel, but it is also Jesus. And so, Jesus here is God's son, but he's also Israel. He is Israel in person. He is Israel's representative, but he is Israel who will get it right and not same, make the same mistakes that have been made years on end. He is Israel who will do what the law has asked and will fulfill God's promises. And even, it's proved again in Matthew, as Jesus goes to the desert for a period of 40. Israel was in the desert for 40 years. Jesus was in the desert for 40 days. And they were both tested there. But Jesus passed the test. And not only is Jesus here a new Israel, but he's also the savior of Israel as well. So he is a new Moses, a new deliverer to save his people out of bondage, not only from the Herods, but from death, the great end of us all. As it says, um, when Herod realized he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem.